a military saber reproduction that actually captured the original's handling dynamics. Count me in. This is the one less new pattern 1796 British light cavalry saber reproduction made under the supervision of Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatoria, a saber expert and antique eater. Angles. So oblique. Look at this angle and check this out. Split the cap cleanly. Again, just to see how it cleaves through the hard plastic part. It's uh, very hard, very durable, can potentially chip an edge, but no damage to the saber. This is a wildly successful model designed by British Major General John Gaspar Lamachon in the year 1795 in conjunction with English sword cutler Henry Osborne. Very popular throughout the 19th century, spawned numerous modified designs, some with straighter blades, some with more curved blades, some with quill back or clear tip to improve its thrusting capacity. But this is the most iconic weapon in the Napoleonic War and about a century after for its notorious cutting capacity. This was designed by John Caspar Lamachon who took inspiration from Austro-Hungarian cavalry sabers, which has a prominent curvature in its blade, and the stereotypical hatchet point near the tip that broadens its width. You can see here the blade starts out rather broad compared to other military sabers at the time, and tapers down slightly along the blade. As they reach the top portion, it broadens into this very raw yet very thin cutting portion. So the ideal cutting portion of this blade is the last one-fifth of the blade where you have an extremely deep bevel and a very thin blade that slash across the surface of the target. It also dictates that the mass distribution make it rather tip light. You think that this is very tip heavy because it's so broad, but up here, at a foible, it's only a quarter of the thickness as the base. So this is a textbook study example of how mass distribution affects the handling of the sword. Even though, as a typical cavalry saber, it has a stereotypical forward point of balance. On this example, 7 inches from the hilt. It carries a lot of authority, but the sword is lightweight. It's only 840 grams. As 
one pound and 30 and a half ounces. A little bit lighter than the typical trooper's version of the 1796 pattern, which is already lightweight compared to some of the older cavalry sabers or patterns from other European countries at the time. And despite its forward balance, it's actually very nimble in the blade, right? You can't really compare to uh, infantry sword, like a Patron or other infantry sabers. Of course, they are more balanced towards the hilt, they are lighter for prolonged fighting and fencing or dues, combat on the battlefield. But handling of this sword is quite amazing that you can actually move it rather fast. So if I have to fight on foot with this, if I am a cavalry and have to dismount and fight someone, I wouldn't be too upset with this sword. Pattern 1796 British Light Cavalry Saber has been a highly sought after model on the antique market. Years ago, you can, you can get an antique of uh, pretty good condition for 300 to 500 pounds, which is very reasonable. But currently, if you want to purchase an antique of good condition, you're basically looking at 1,000 to 2,000 pounds. So you can forget about cutting with them. You can get a good sense of handling of these. A uh, very popular model, but if you want to experience what makes this sword so successful and popular in some test cutting, well, you're out of luck because there's no good reproduction model on the market. Most reproductions today are really acting great, so they mostly look apart in the background, they don't look so out of place, but some of the details are neglected because they are extremely budget oriented, so really actors don't have to spend a lot of money. And the premium reproduction companies or makers on the market just don't want to touch military savers because they used to be rather affordable, the antique ones, so you don't really need reproductions. But today, it makes sense more than ever to have good reproductions on the market. So Matt Easton is doing us a service by working with Windless he first sold an antique 1796 British Light Cavalry Saber to Windless, and he worked as a consultant. They sent him several prototypes that had been rejected. So finally, all the details has been ironed out. Most notably, the blade. Now, two and a half years ago, I reviewed the post seal version of the British 1796 Light Cavalry Saber, also made by Windless as a contract maker. At the time, I pointed out that this is probably, well, this was the best offering on the market that went quite a bit further than other Rayan Acton grade saber of this model. It has a digital taper. Contrary to popular beliefs, post steel swords are mostly not crowbars, even though, yeah, they're heavier and less maneuverable than most originals. So the cold steel version also made by Windless, starts out at 8 millimeters at base. It tapers up to 5 near the center, and it, when it goes up to the foible, along the entirety uh, of the portion past the fuller, it's still around 4, 3 to 4 millimeters, which is a far cry from the originals. This one is an accurate reproduction, because past the fuller is entirely under 2 millimeters. And it starts out thicker, just as I suggested uh, in my review of the Cold Steel's version. I suggested to start out thicker and a lot thinner on the top half of the blade. This one starts out at 9 millimeters, a full millimeter or 12.5% thicker at base, and it tapers down in the thickness drastically. It has a concave distal taper, meaning that. The rate of sitting down is rather rapid in the bottom half. Tapers down to under 4 mm at midpoint, down from 9, so it already lost more than half of the mass along the blade. And past the fuller, the top one fifth of the blade is entirely under 2, and the tip is already 1.7 mm. And on the same spot, of the coastal version is 3.4 millimeters. So coincidentally, it's only half of thickness on the top portion. And if you compare them side by side, 
you'll be able to see how much thicker the cold steel is compared to this new windless model. Result is, even though it's only a one to two millimeters apart, it's so much more lively and faster. Whereas this one, you have to just give it a lot of more force and energy and recovery is a lot slower. Even though it's only one to two millimeters in difference, it's twice the mass on top. So this is extremely nimble, despite being forwardly balanced. How perceivably little difference in the details can change a lot in the handling. This one is close to one kilogram, two pounds and three ounces, and this one is six ounces lighter. And it's not just lighter, that six ounces comes entirely from the top portion of the blade. So why are swords described as a natural extension of your arm when it handles right, instead of a slow moving crowbar? Because the top portion, in comparison to the base, has to be so much lighter, it carries so much less weight. And side by side, by the same maker, we can just tell the difference immediately. As soon as you hold these two, it's almost like night and day. It feels only half the weight of this one. Although it's only 15% lighter. Even though this cold steel is about 40% cheaper than this new offering, uh, you can safely retire this model now because it's simply no good compared to the new model. There are other details that have been refined. This one has a historically accurate steel scabbard instead of the floppy leather sheets on the cold seal version. It's also done right on the spine of the scabbard. It's quite flat. It also has a larger uh, heavy duty rings. So very accurate to the trooper's version. Another detail the new model has improved upon the old one is the quillons tapering. As you can see, it's extremely tapered to be a thin near the extremity. Whereas this one is quite chunky. I suspect that this Cosio model's hilt is uh, based on model 1811 Prussian Blucher Saber. So it's uh, kind of a clone of the British model by the Prussians. Uh, even though the hilt portion is generally speaking a little bit more uh, chunky, uh, less refined than the British model. The other detail is that this uh, P-shaped stirrup guard is uh, less sick compared to the Cold Seal model. So it, it's got all the details right uh, because they have an antique in hand. Some other improvements include the chamfering of this metal legged. So now it's no longer sharp on the edges. It wouldn't bite into your palm when you handle the sword. So that's a welcoming change. You can see that lots of the details have been done right, corrected because of Matt East's console. The width of the guard, where it meets the grip, is also uh, narrowed down to mimic the original. Whereas on the Cosio model, it's rather wide, so it sticks out more, comparing to the new model. This further reduces the weight. Now, 840 grams is well within the historical range, uh, because the originals based on the same pattern, uh, vary quite a bit in the weight. Most of the troopers version are above two pounds, 900 grams, but officers versions are a little bit lighter, 800 to 900 grams. Uh, this is probably one of the more refined versions, and I like that compared to Cold Steel's blade, the hatchet point is done right, whereas the old one doesn't really flare out that much has a different tip geometry. I definitely prefer this one. The originals have some variations, but this is more stereotypical. Look at how broad the tip is. Obviously, this reduces the thrusting capacity because the center of the tip is at an angle so different, right? So crooked from the direction of your thrust. Just doesn't thrust well, if you thrust into a fleshy part, then protect it by closing and uniform, yeah, you can probably do some damage, but 
primarily this is a cutting sword. Even when you do a thrust, it's like a push cut. And you can imagine it on horseback, yeah, if you do a thrusting motion, this is mostly a push cut. And you use the edge, curved edge, to slice into the target. One further improvement I would like to see from Willis is the edge geometry. And this is a stereotypical windlass, one millimeter thickness on the edge, and they sharpen it with a very pronounced secondary bevel. The transition from the primary bevel to the secondary bevel is so jarring, it's like a sudden change of angle. Now, in practice, this doesn't really affect the cutting capacity that much, it will just make the cutting a little bit less smooth. Well, of course, uh, the end user can fix this. Bell sender uh, or so, or some uh, files. You can blend in the secondary bevel with the primary one and create an apple seeding, which is seen on the original ones. And you can see on this uh, 3D scanned model of the, this pattern 1796 by the Oakshot Institute, based on an antique, you see the upper portion is somewhat convex kind of like a lenticular cross-section. And we do know that these 3D scanners are quite high resolution, so this is rather accurate. Whereas the windless version is rather flat on the upper portion. There's not a very noticeable lenticular cross-section. So I hope this can be improved. Of course, I'm gonna do some additional sharpening to fix this, but the mass distribution on this plate is captured spot on. I got two of these and shipped from Brother Nathaniel to me and Brother Nathaniel measured both and found that both have excellent distal taper. The other one uh, weighs a little bit more and feels a little bit less refined in the handling but it's still very historical. About one ounce heavier than this. Still lighter than most troopers version. This is definitely a triumph to nailing the, the mass distribution. When you have reproductions, right? at least for me personally, on these good reproductions, is the handling. You need to capture the handling dynamics of the original to a T. And Willis has done a good job on some recent models, the Royal Armouries collection, also in collaboration with Matt Easton and the Royal Armouries. Of course, that I reviewed last year, they nailed the digital paper and the profile excellent handling, much, much more preferable than their old models. Now, this is what I have been advocating from Willis all along. But why don't you work with experts, right? And look at some originals. Make sure, not necessarily with complex hill fittings or something ornate, just emulate the handling. And this proves that Willis is capable of doing that. They should go back to the drawing board and revamp, they'll probably come up with new models, just ditch the old ones, which usually have very minimal distal right? That make them handle not like originals at all, that they claim they are trying to replicate. So far, I've only talked about the positive. I would have given it a 10 out of 10 if everything else is fine, but unfortunately, this is with the square talking. Other than the historical handling, the other Achilles heel is the quality control. I have been focusing so much on the handling aspect that when I looked down on the hill, I was horrified. If you just look at it on glass, it's pretty obvious that it's misaligned. It's crooked in relation to the blade. It's bent this way. Now, this is very alarming. Assuming that the entire hill is bent, it might mean that the ten within is also bent. So this creates a hot spot. When you cut with a sword, it could have some stress where they start bending and then it could shatter or stay bent forever. But when I look at this, I see every piece of fitting on the hill has been crooked or misaligned in some way, right? This P-shaped stirrup guard, it's asymmetrical. And we have observed this on the Wakefield hair, also made by Windless in the Royal Armouries collection. That's a lesser issue. I'm not looking to have perfect symmetry, especially on a budget reproduction. 
But then, look at this lanyard. It's almost fitted on like those uh, Fortune Fire episodes where the Smith only has like 20 minutes to finish a build and they just uh, rush the whole thing over, glue everything together. And this is obviously just not only asymmetric, it's crooked, mounted sideways. On this side, there's a very large gap, almost like half a centimeter wide. You see this occasionally on some antique source, but those are like 200 years old. I would imagine that brand new, they wouldn't have a gap this large. After hundreds of years, the wooden part of the grip has shrunk, the leather also degraded. But when you flip it, you see there's almost no gap here at all. So <laughs> this Lengit is mounted sideways, canted away from the blade. We know that Willis makes their grips by heating up the tent and drill a hole into this wooden grip. So they don't make two wooden slap and glue them together around the tent. They have like a one piece grip. So when they drill the hole, something must have gone wrong that the drill hole is not in the center of the grip. Now, usually you'll be able to polish the wooden part out uh, so they look mostly symmetrical, but they didn't do a good job here. And when they mount this, uh, the langit, the metal part, the guard, since everything has to be connected, you see this P-shaped guard is connected to the langit in this uh, iconic bird's beak part of the grip. And you can see the grip is sticking out. And I have never seen something like this on antique example. So this is quite a shame, being that when they drill the hole, it, it's not in the center, it, it's crooked. And they didn't try to fix this. They just mount everything on hastily. See the hilt is all rattly, meaning it's slightly loose. And where the P-shaped guard connects to uh, the back langit, you can see there are some sharp burrs sticking out so this is never good because it's loose Langit is shaving the steel to create these burrs just look at how crooked the hilt is in relation to the blade and this is a shame because it's a symmetrical hilt there's no side bars so there's no reason at all it should can't one way you can see the gap here, where it sticks out, doesn't uh, meet the blanket and the guard, creating this gap. The blade is uh, mounted rather tight into the guard, but there's some gap in between, and you can see some uh, epoxy sticking out. Nothing unacceptable, uh, just noteworthy. And the uh, leather wrapping. It's pretty nice. Uh, the grip is kind of bulky. It's uh, tapered in this way, so it swells a little bit in this dimension, or sits well in your hand, but a little bit bulky. The sharp burrs here look pretty dangerous, so it has to be filed. These lengths here on the side of the scabbard uh, is rather thin to mimic the originals, so that's very nice. Original swords are not perfect, are not seeking to have perfection, but there's a spectrum of acceptability. For me personally, the cutoff line is when the flaws negatively impact the handling and the structural integrity of the sword, or cause some jarring visual oddities. Now I have sharpened the edge, which didn't come sharp despite the secondary bevel, it took me 50 minutes to apex the edge and increase the depth of the secondary bevel twice as much to create a proper apple seed geometry to blend in the two bevels. As you can see, it cuts well and it handles with both finesse and authority. Suffice to say, the crooked hilt didn't really affect the precision of the cuts. The blade also moves very well and it feels easy to stop and redirect. Despite a forward balance for being a cavalry saber, if I attach a pommel to the end, this would handle totally like a lightweight medieval falchion. So far so good. Makes me not want to exchange this one for another. 
Brother Nathaniel, who sent me this saber, says the other one he got also has a very sloppy hilt assembly. So it looks like this is a consistent quality control issue. I'm not so confident that I will get a better example if I choose to exchange for another one from the vendor. So I'll keep it and enjoy its lively handling in more cutting sessions. In typical windless fashion, there's a lot of rippling on the blade surface. This is, by and large, due to the skills, confidence, and experience of the grinder. It has nothing to do with whether or not this is hand-forged. I'll prefer a smoother grind and polish, but since this doesn't affect the functionality, I'll take it. Plus, on the antique originals, many of them have comparable amount of rippling, especially in the fullers. On a side note, I found the flexibility on the seam foible sometimes cause the incision to wobble if the edge alignment of a particular cut isn't great. It will still cut, just not as cleanly. But this is true to the original. Another faithful recreation is the heavy-duty scabbard, which weighs more than the sword itself. I've seen measurements on multiple antique originals, and they're all like that. Overall, a great reproduction that definitely has gone into the right direction. A first for military sabers. Hope more future models are on the way. I have reviewed four models developed under the supervision of Matt Easton in the past six months, and all of them are fantastic offerings. Clearly, he has done wonderful work lately for the reproduction market. As for windless, Quality control clearly needs to be improved. Nevertheless, pulling off the complex non-linear distal taper and nailing the handling dynamics of a renowned antique pattern is in itself a triumph.